It's my very, very great honor to present or introduce Professor Mia White, uh, who's a newer faculty member here at UCSB in the Black Studies Department. Amazing, amazing woman who has inspired me every time I've met with her. Um, so Mia Charlene White is an assistant professor of urban studies in the Department of Black Studies at UCSB. She is an Afro-Asian urban sociology studying the racial, economic, and gendered consequences of neoliberal regimes of spatial discipline, including redlining, gentrification, displacement, dispossession, and toxic dumping, uh, as well as the origins and possibilities of activist or bottom-up challenges to these processes. She's going to be talking about some of those concepts today. And without further ado, very excited to introduce you to Mia White. Hello, everybody. This is amazing. Um, I just want to say again to Emily and the steering committee, thank you so much for getting us together these couple of days. This is very important for us to do, especially in the current polit political climate. We have to find ways to get together and to keep our energy up and to stay connected. So um, let's make sure that, OK, presentation mode. So I'm going to, again, my name is Mia White. I'm an assistant professor um, in the Black Studies Department. I focus on urban studies. I'm going to sort of start with a so-called Afro-pessimistic perspective. I'm going to, in, in sort of Howie's tradition, lay out some of the problems and the challenges and the threats. And then I'm hoping that you'll see I'm moving toward a James Baldwinian Afro-optimist perspective, where I'm trying to re-envision how we understand the problems. Um, and I want to begin with a poem, uh, uh, sort of as a, as a sign of respect to my, my fellow scholars in the Department of Black Studies who have showed me that social scientists should pay more attention to literature. Um, so I want to read a, a poem by Bunyan Bryant, uh, who is a famed environmental justice activist, African American, wonderful scholar and um, activist from Flint, Michigan. And he wrote this over a decade ago and it's called um, The Most Vulnerable. The polluted air on a hot fill night makes for shallow breathing and chest filled tight. Pollution confines the elderly to heat filled room causing suffocation and life threatening doom. Often we can't see it, smell it, or taste it. Hazardous waste has brought us grief much to our disbelief. How can I stand it? When babies born without brain, to this I dread and complain. Indigenous children playing on mounds of uranium tailings whose energies are zapped by cancer. Health is failing. Mothers in protest and stormy hate. Blue babies suffocate from water bearing nitrate. When baby Jim died, oh how we cried. Did the death of this boy subsidize the wealth of the nation, even though this baby was one of God's creation? I read this because my goal uh, with you in this next 20 or 30 minutes is to really uh, spatialize the experience that each of us has as human beings on this earth. And obviously, uh, Bunny and Brian is talking about the black experience. Um, in a very racialized, toxic space uh, that we all know, hopefully by now, is Flint, Michigan. Um, but this is sort of a, a poetic model, analytic model, for us to understand the crisis right now. So I'm going to try to use history to explore what Bunny and Bryant is talking about here. Now, um, because I come from MIT, <laughs> My PhD was in MIT. I feel I have to uh, make a little bit of a joke about this idea of quantum entanglement um, because it, 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 it's actually, um, it's actually uh, exactly perfect for this interdisciplinary approach to race and space. Quantum entanglement is this idea where pairs or groups of particles are generated or interact in wage such that the state of each particle cannot be described independently. In other words, a quantum state must be described for the system as a whole, uh, the system. So we're here to think about the system. Now I want to understand what are the particles, right, that may become entangled in this quantum idea. 
And what I'm trying, I, I think I, I'm backing up a lot of what Howie said, and I'm using kind of a, a, a physics uh, uh, analogy to get you to think about this visually. Now look at the laser beam here, right? The laser beam, I think, and, and I, I'm trying, I have to be linear a little bit in the conception of history here. This laser beam, I think, represents, again, with some limitations, time, okay? And so think about how we understand time and how time travels. The crystal here is going to represent one pillar of what we're gonna call white supremacy. Others call it war capitalism. The vertically polarized photons are the other, the other legs of the pillars, which I'm gonna discuss now. Time in the context of the United States operates through these pillars. So if we wanna reconceptualize our relationships to each other, which are entangled, thus this quantum entanglement analogy. We have to understand this system as a whole, as deeply entangled and embedded. So what do I mean? Let's begin with the idea of American progress. Um, we know that the idea of American progress was predicated, right, on ideas of land theft, occupation, male ownership of property, misogyny, and of course, eventually, slavery. Now, I'm gonna take a slightly different tack than, than, than um, others because I think my role here is to really link the relationship between people and land in our conception of the problem. So let's think about Sven Beckert's work, among others. Um, he wrote, of course, Empire of Cotton, and maybe many of you know this book. Um, but um, his work was actually preceded by a Trinidadian scholar um, who taught political science at Howard University, who wrote a book in 1944 called Capitalism and Slavery. His name is Eric Williams. Um, he's the much lesser known black scholar who wrote about this very same topic in 1944. It was Sven Beckert from Harvard recently wrote this book, Empire of Cotton. And um, it really made an impression on me. Uh, I started to um, really wrestle with this idea of how it is that we've occupied land over time. So we know that American, the idea of American progress and manifest destiny required the theft of, of native and indigenous land the expropriation of their land, and of course, genocide, right? So we know that it required removal of people and a rearticulation of space. In the 18th and 19th centuries, we know that through Sven's work, this global web of cotton agriculture, commerce, and industrial revolution was predicated on slave labor, right? So, so here now again, this idea of the relationship between land and people, and how have different kinds of people been articulated, marginalized, and exploited in order to change the land, right? In order to create value. So this idea of cotton has gotten me, you know, really thinking um, a lot. Recently on Facebook, there was a friend who posted an image of cotton from Whole Foods because you could buy decorative stalks of cotton um, in the same way that you can buy roses and carnations. And this is a, a black scholar friend of mine and she posted that she felt a deep discomfort seeing a white woman buy this, this stock of cotton. And so then we proceeded to engage, you know, me and many others in this debate about what this represents, the symbolic violence, the, the embodiment of this, and you know, how d different ones of us experience cotton in such a different way. Of course, for that white woman, this represented something beautiful, perhaps archaic, and it did not have the same symbolic uh, uh, value that it did for, for others of us. So I think one of the goals for us, if we want to imagine a next system, is to um, re-embrace history, to re-embrace a critical history in order to imagine something new or newer. Now, it's really difficult to embrace history. It's one thing to say, you know, we, we, we've inherited a lot of racism. It's another to actually think that um, Theorizing, in other words, making meaning from what slavery has created in the United States is key to our next system. 
So I don't want to think of it as background, as like a Wikipedia list of bad stuff. I want to think of slave agriculture and its inception, its relationship to industrial production in the 18th and 19th century as key to our next systems, key to our new imaginaries that are um, predicated on mutual emancipation. So how do we get there? Well, it first requires us to recognize what it cost, what slavery cost. This image is, um, uh, 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 I'm totally blanking on his, um, oh boy. That's right, thank you, Jacob Lawrence. <laughs> I think I didn't have enough sleep last night. This image is from Jacob Lawrence. It's called Through Forest, Trees, and Rivers. Thank you. I think it's 1968. And the reason I chose this image is because the artist, the African-American artist, Jacob Lawrence, um, you know, symbolizing the black arts movement of the 60s, chooses to portray people as literally imbricated with nature. If you see the manner in which he draws and his line and the choice of color, it's almost difficult to disassociate people and nature in this image, right? This is the kind of image that I want you to hold as we start to think about what is needed for the next system. It's not about um, making peace necessarily with our histories of white supremacy and indigenous domination. It's actually about thinking through those resources and using them beyond peace, even beyond reparations, to create new imaginaries. I'll, I'll get back to the reparations. I know that's a bit controversial. Um, I want to say a little bit about surveillance and uh, surveillance and criminalization. So. You know, the first, this image here that Jacob Lawrence has created for us um, not only imbricates people and nature, but it makes us think about surveillance and how surveillance today does not occupy a historical exceptionalism, okay? Now, I know it's really difficult because in a sense, we're saying we need a new system of existing together. And at the, t at the same time, I'm saying we do, but it's not because we exist in a moment of historical exceptionalism. If we insist that we exist in a moment of historical exceptionalism, we then erase the magnitude of threat, oppression, and brutality, but also opportunity of the past. So we don't exist in moments of historical exceptionalism, right? And this image that James Baldwin has provided to us is an example of the continued, of the historical surveillance that has um, been part and parcel of state projects in the United States. Another example, how to tell your friends from the Japs, right? This is a little bit later, this is uh, 1941. Again, state projects, right, have always been about ordering and surveillance in space, right? Now, we can decide that we want to bury this history and make it irrelevant and create something completely new, or we can say whatever our so-called next projects are, they have to not only bear witness to these kinds of imaginaries that we see here in this image, but they have to use them as resources as resources, both uh, you know, intellectual resources, but existential resources for imagining what is going to combat what this produced. What, what does this produce? These kinds of images, the James Baldwin image, and this image about telling your friends, uh, differentiating between Chinese and Japanese. What is produced in the space of these kinds of images? I'm concerned that in our ideas about idealizing next, next systems, what we want to do is list all the really bad stuff, and then we just want to turn the page. And I'm saying we cannot turn the page because of that idea of quantum entanglement. It's not, it's not so much the, the 
cognate idea of intersectionality. It's actually the idea of that we are entangled with history and we can't forsake it. Now, I know this sounds very pessimistic in the, in the, in the spirit of Afro-pessimism, but I actually think that in order to move toward a more optimistic next system, you have to be open and fully woke to these realities, right? That one, we are not in a moment of historical exceptionalism. And two, we cannot forsake these awful histories. We have to actually use them in restorative and transform transformative ways. This is you know, more, more recent. We know that histories of hate and histories of crisis, right? Literally orient the history of the United States, right? Some people came here because they were being surveilled by the carceral state um, in, in um, old Britain, right? Some people came here because they were being um, attacked uh, and, and had the threat of imprisonment, right, from, from various parts of Europe. Indigenous people were captured, killed, and removed. Slaves were corralled and fixed into certain carceral spaces called plantations, right? We, we are sitting in space that is thought to be Mexican land, right? So you are on stolen Mexican and Native American land. Um, so, so this idea of, of the three pillars and what Sven Beckert calls war capitalism, right? Um, he says that the three pillars are slaveability, colonialism, and he uses the phrase orientalism to talk about war. Oh, I'm sorry, this is Andrea Smith's diagram, but they both come to this same sort of point. She calls it white supremacy, he calls it war capitalism. Again, I'm, I'm presenting this to you in the spirit of Afro-pessimism to kind of lay a, 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 um, a theoretical groundwork for where we are, how to understand. Orientalism really is about spatializing the other over there and seeking to expropriate their resources, environmental, spatial, social, political resources towards imperialism or colonialism or growth what Sven calls war capitalism, okay? Um, now, if, if somehow we're able to take a couple of steps back, this is, this is extraordinarily painful, it's very triggering for a lot of people, it's very difficult to face this history. If, if we wanna kinda really flatten this and generalize it, we can say that, okay, what was involved in white supremacy and war capitalism was the corralling and organization of capital, skills, networks, and institutions, which I wrote at the bottom here. I don't know, it's not, it's not as clear. And the creation of those worlds, right? Those worlds, those differentiated worlds, those worlds that created racial hierarchies and class hierarchies occurred through practices of production, trade, and consumption. I know that sounds very flat and economic and boring, but if we were gonna flatten this, these three pillars, perhaps those are some of the ideas that we will pull out. So if we wanted to go next and say, okay, we're in this very tight connection. It's a quantum entanglement of history, right? And we know that land, people, and institutions, as I've tried to lay out through histories of slavery, indigenous appropriation, et cetera, and so forth, connect us, right? What next? What do we do next? How do we create justice in this framework, this historical framework, through this quantum entanglement? What kind of justice is possible, right? Now, I don't have much time left, um, but I do want to not just leave you with this sort of Afro-pessimist framework, but I wanna move toward that optimism that James Baldwin often talked about in his nonfiction, which calls us to engage in socially creative thinking experimental thinking about other worlds, right? J.K. Gibson Graham is a wonderful, uh, that name is actually two authors and because they didn't, they, want, they, they always publish together, they have this kind of funny name, anyway. So thinking practices that promote creativity, okay? Gibson Graham, these feminists, have come up with these three very interesting 
ways of engaging this idea, engaging the threat and oppressive histories, right, that we are entangled with, right? One, how do you attend to the effect of our analysis, okay? So in order to release hope and possibility for next systems, we have to engage the pain and feelings of loss and feelings of threat and oppression that are created through the kinds of images that I showed, the James Baldwin image, uh, James, uh, um, why can I not remember his name? Jacob Lawrence, sorry, the Jacob Lawrence image, thank you. Number two, generating alternative discourses. Now how do we generate alternative discourses? I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. And then three, adopting an experimental orientation. Now I'm running a little bit out of time, but for the first one, thinking is not something that operates in a register separate from your body, from your emotions. Any arguments and thinking that you engage in actually invoke visceral reactions, right? Intensities and emotional narratives usually pop into your brain. You have this experience, you recall something your great grandmother said, you recall an image that you experienced that created a feeling inside of you. How do you actually sit with those feelings in order to get to that place of hope and possibility? It's a very difficult thing, and in fact, in our rapid um, system, you know, social media infected worlds, I find most people are unable to do this, unable to sit and experience the visceral reactions, right, produced through oppressive histories, okay? And, 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 but we need to do that in order to think about alternative discourses, right? How do you think about an alternative economy if you don't know from where you are starting and from where you came, right, or from where we came? And then this idea of um, experimentation. Now, I'm not saying we must move all the way from critique and, and leave critique and move to experimentation, but we need to engage in, in this, you know, sort of dialectic, you know, playfulness between critique and experimentation, so that we think about other worlds and other imaginaries, right? Otherwise, we will not survive as activists or advocates or academic activist wannabes like myself. We will not survive. Our lives will crush us and our thoughts will depress us. So this, this is a, a very, a very um, basic representation of the first, I think one of the first steps. Now, we understand, I think you understand what Howie was laying out, which is what is the neoliberal discourse? The neoliberal discourse, right, is that the market can solve everything, right? And that you have to farm out government um, services to the market and the market will then be able to provide those services to the people. So the neoliberal logic is what dominates. But does it really dominate your everyday life? This iceberg is sort of showing you all the other things that are happening in your life, even as you are part of that quantum um, entanglement that I talked about, right? That Jacob Lawrence illustrated for us. Got his name, okay? So all these, so the 15% of the iceberg of the, above the water is what we tend to focus on. And the 85% of the iceberg below the water, which is what we actually do with our bodies every day, hugging, kissing, loving, arguing, dreaming, sleeping, why are those irrelevant? Why are those things irrelevant? Now, we live in an era of real terror, right? I, I understand that and I don't minimize it whatsoever. But be, because we have a goal here, right, for these couple of days that has to go beyond problematization, we have to think through what is next and through what what existential mechanisms, what historical resources, how what are the imaginaries through which we're gonna produce our next system? I just wanna give you, this, I know this is extraordinarily difficult to read, so I'll read it to you, and I think um, I'm almost done, two slides left. Uh, the Youth Justice Coalition, which is a, a not-for-profit, community-based um, organizing um, uh, uh, outfit, has created this really uh, interesting 
image that kind of um, demonstrates this idea. We're entangled in this quantum uh, sort of mechanics of history, right? We, we, we can't walk through white supremacy, right? It's, it's on us, it's all through us, just like patriarchy. It's in the air, it's smog, it's not going anywhere, right? So that is, that is illustrated through these arrows, I mean, through this line, this horizontal line, right? So, so in other words, they're saying there is a propensity for surveillance of black and brown and othered youth, as, as illustrated by A, arrest, right? And then you those youths, because this is a Youth Justice Coalition, will go through these various phases, right? Through, very, through um, um, the criminal justice, you know, sort of um, regime. But the Youth Justice Coalition is, is trying to point out to us other ways that they can engage, right, these alternatives. So they say the first trap is the criminalization of youth, right? Um, and then they say the second trap is um, alternatives to arrest and court that widen the net, that actually widen the net. And the third is prohibition and other system-run alternatives, right? And then the fourth trap is pressure to take a plea, but all along here, there are alternatives that we can press for right? Police diversion, alternatives to court, alternatives to detention, non-residential alternatives to incarceration, residential placement alternatives, you know, community-owned and, and, and operated alternatives. And um, I can send you this image. I know it's difficult to read. Another example is, is what I actually study, community land trusts. Now, you know, rather than being in debt, um, and being surveilled, right, by the um, finance state regime that we all are entangled in, there are other ways of existing. In fact, UCSB students could be living in a commun urban community land trust, right, with housing that um, is more affordable. It's not even the is, is not even the word. They could graduate from college with a ten thousand dollar check. We, we, we have no way right now, given our current landscape of, of, um, of understanding all of the possibilities with the current landscape, the way that pedagogy operates at, in school when we think about housing policy or housing finance. I took a course in housing policy and finance as a PhD student at Harvard. I was not taught this. I had to find this out on my own, that this exists, that there are over 300 of these in the world but not here. Students pay $1,100 to share a room, a 10 by 12 box, right? So the question is, what is possible? How do you imagine what's possible? What are the resources that you have to imagine what's possible, right? So it's not to leave behind the pessimistic reality of criticism because we have to bring that with us, it always is with us, but then we have to think, well, what's the, what's the Youth Justice Coalition imagining? What are the mistakes that they're making that we can make and make in a different way? What are community land trusts doing? Right? What, what is a com urban community land trust? Is that even possible? Is that a pipe dream? It's not. They exist all over the world. Why don't we have one here? Why don't you live in one? So I want to leave you with a more positive poem. Um, Everything is waiting for you. Your great mistake is to act the drama as if you were alone, as if life were a progressive and cunning crime with no witness to the tiny hidden transgressions. To feel abandoned is to deny the intimacy of your surroundings. Surely, even you, at times, have felt the grand array the swelling presence, and the chorus crowding out your solo voice, you must note the way the soap dish enables you, or the window latch grants you freedom. Alertness is the hidden discipline of familiarity. The stairs are your mentor of things to come. The doors have always been there to frighten you and invite you, and the tiny speaker in the phone is your dream ladder to divinity. Put down the weight of your aloneness and ease into the conversation. The kettle is singing even as it pours you a drink. The cooking pots have left their arrogant aloofness and seen the good in you at last. All the birds and creatures of the world are unutterably themselves. 
everything is waiting for you. Thank you.